Hi, my name is Dave Wood and I'm the founder of Type Focus, a company devoted to the career success of your students. The focus for this session is on the transitions your students go through and how you can help them. I'll present ideas via this video and you'll get a chance to discuss them in small groups, so you're really going to be learning from yourselves. Your moderator will facilitate large group discussions and keep us all on track. A 5x5 five five is a group of five discussing for five minutes. Break into 5x5s five five now. This would be 5x5 five five number one. Move around and get to know someone new. Introduce yourself. Name what you do and one thing you're proud of in your co-op program. So the moderator will pause the video for eight minutes. Three minutes to regroup and five minutes to discuss. So pause the video now. Welcome back to their main discussion. This would be 5x5 five five number 2. In your small group, discuss what role does your co-op program play in the success of your students? What role do you play in the success of your students? Does anyone take responsibility for students that drop out? Pause the video for 10 minutes, 5 minutes for the 5x5 five five and 5 minutes for group sharing. Stop the video now. As we begin to discuss the whole situation, there isn't much point to having a great co-op program if your student drops out before the program is over. Close to 50% of students in two-year colleges drop out. And this number is rising as the economic meltdown forces less qualified students back to school to prepare for employment. The biggest dropout rate is always first year. I think this is because the first year presents the biggest changes and challenges to the student. It is the time of greatest transition. Why do students drop out? Look at this table. This is information very, very recent from 2012 data for Ontario. Almost half say, because they don't like it, it's not for me. What does this really mean, don't like it, not for me? Under what conditions would one not like a program? I think this is probably code for they're feeling scared, confused, and uncertain. These are all normal expectations for anyone in the neutral zone. The neutral zone is a transitions concept. Let's turn to that model now. The vertical bar measures coping effectiveness. Many of you have seen the Tom Hanks movie, Sleepless in Seattle. He had a great marriage, lost his wife to illness, became somewhat depressed, and therefore sleepless, so his young son was worried. The arrow represents the change. In this case, it is the death of his wife. This results in a drop in effectiveness. That means he's depressed. Bridges calls this the ending zone. All change brings about an end to something. The next period of time is a prolonged period of reduced effectiveness. Bridges calls this the neutral zone. It is between the endings that the change is brought and the beginnings of what can be started when the endings have been worked through. It is a time of finding out who am I post-change. Tom Hanks knew who he was as a husband. He's not so sure who he is as a single man. He has to figure this out before he can move on to a new beginning. Depending on how he answers the question in the neutral zone, the beginnings may not be all that positive. Tom may decide his, wife, his life is not worth living. He may decide that life will never be quite as good and resign himself to loneliness. He may get over it and return to his previous level of effectiveness. He could learn some important lessons and become even more effective. What I'm hoping is that you can help your co-op students to reach this higher plane. Bridges' metaphor of the Israelites leaving Egypt helps put this model into focus. They were slaves in Egypt for many generations. They didn't like it, but they knew who they were and it was stable. The change was leaving and crossing the Red Sea. Their endings included being afraid they wouldn't have enough to eat. The neutral zone was the desert where they wandered for two full generations. They were finding out who they were. Their mindset changed from slaves to tough nomadic warriors. Now they could face the trials of conquering the Promised Land, something they never could have done if they'd gone straight from the Red Sea to the Promised Land. They were figuring out, who are we, post-change? But 
The neutral zone is a very scary place, and many wanted to actually go back to Egypt. Bridges calls this fleeing the neutral zone, and in the co-op setting, it is dropping out, going back to the comfort of the pre-change world. Unfortunately, it will likely result in a loss of self-esteem. I tried and failed, so there is a long-term loss. Let's look at how the concept of endings might be applied to your students. The pre-change stability is their pre-college life, high school or work. They are likely not totally satisfied, but it is familiar. The change is entering the program. The change brings about endings. What changes when a person enters one of your co-op programs? This will be your 5x5 five five number 3. What ends with those changes? For example, a change might be larger classes. What ends is a sense of intimacy. Pause the video here for five minutes. As we come back to discuss the answers to the 5x5 uh, five five number 3, just some of the points you probably really covered in your small groups, but I'll run over a few of them. The reference group is really how they understand who they are. These are their close friends. They might say, I was a star soccer player in high school, but now I can't even make the team. The congruence with self-image is they will compare themselves to the people that they know well. Now they're amidst people they don't know very well, they're not sure who they are. They might say, I'm not sure if I'm funny. I'm not sure if I'm a good player. Their support network is no longer there. They might say things like, I've lost all my really close friends. I don't know who to hang out with on a Friday night. Their academic expectations are unpredictable. They might have said, I used to get straight B's without too much effort. Now I'm struggling just to pass. And literally, they can be lost if they're in a new city, a new campus. So what happens is that they experience loss, and they grieve the loss. They'll go into the neutral zone. The neutral zone is a very tough place to be. It is also the heart of the transition process. How do we help students? Bridges suggests that changing the metaphor is a good way to help people rethink their options in the neutral zone. A metaphor captures the feelings of a student in a neutral zone. If you are asking one, how does this feel? If they are overwhelmed, they might answer, like I'm lost in the woods. Think back to your own experience in college. What was your metaphor? This would be your 5x5 five five, number 4. Think about your own metaphor and share your metaphor with your group. Pause the video here for 5 minutes. Coming back to the large group now, if your metaphor was negative, how could you change it to be more optimistic? For example, what would have been changed so the feeling of being lost in the woods becomes more of an exciting adventure? Talk about what changes to your own metaphor would have made it more optimistic. Example, a lost in the woods becomes an adventure if you are prepared for it. What changes to your metaphor would be needed to make it more positive? In your 5x5 five five number 5, discuss in your 5x5 five five group how these changes could have been translated into an action plan for your success. So, for example, if your metaphor as a college student was that you were lost in the woods, and we talked about that, and we'd say, what would you need if you were lost in the woods? You might say, I need a compass and a map. Translating that into uh, your action plan would be creating a study plan. If you decided that being lost in the woods you needed bush survival skills, this might be library skills. If you decided being lost in the woods would be much easier if you had a friend with you, maybe this translates to co-op advisor. So pause the video here for 10 minutes. Five minutes for your 5x5 five five, and five minutes for a moderator to canvas the large group for some examples. Picking up on the idea of the transition model. The discussion that you've just had is very useful to follow when talking to your students because it fits their experience and leads to a discussion of reasonable actions that can form a plan. You'll find this an engaging workshop exercise if you're talking to a group of students, say after their first co-op experience. Focus on the changes needed to become more positive and proactive. Remember this table? 
I said it was likely a reflection of the discomfort being felt in the neutral zone. Don't like it, not for me? Maybe excuses to quit and flee the neutral zone, rather than tough it out to discover who they are, to grow past their comfort zone. If the student doesn't drop out, then they have a chance to answer the question, who am I? When this question is answered, the student is ready to move to the last step. Some who don't have support will come to the sad conclusions about themselves and their post-secondary experience will be limiting for them. What we really want is for your students not just to survive, but to thrive. We started this session by thinking about your students' success. Would you agree that helping your students to navigate the neutral zone is within the scope of your role? I'm hoping you would. In summary, at this point we can see that the transition model predicts that students will be in the neutral zone and stressed out trying to answer the question, who am I really? Answering the question, who am I, is really about self-awareness and one of the best tools for understanding yourself is a personality indicator. Examples of personality assessments include the MBTI and the Type Focus Type Indicator. They all create the familiar four-letter code. For example, I'm an ENFP. In order to put the value of the personality type into perspective, we will do a couple of simple exercises. Start by signing your name on your handout. Just sign it as if you were signing a check. So I'll give you a few seconds to do that. Just sign your name anywhere on any piece of paper that you have access to. So hopefully you all have your name signed. Now sign your name again just under your signature, but now use your other hand. Most people are groaning by now and really struggling to make this uh, second signature work. What are some words you would use to describe your second signature? Most people come up with messy, childish, awkward, awful. And how would you feel at the end of the day if you had to use only your non-preferred hand? Most people would say tired, exhausted, frustrated, drained, worn out. This all relates back to success at work. Have you ever been in a job that just didn't work for you? You may, may have blamed the job or yourself. Chances are it wasn't the job or you. It was the lack of fit between what the job needed and what your personality brought to it. When you were born, your brain was hardwired for certain preferences, just like the preference to use one hand over the other. As you grew up, you became either right or left-handed. You developed your personality in a similar way. When you find work that fits your personality, it will feel natural. If you work against your personality, it will be like a right-handed person having to use her left hand all day. You can use it, but it will be draining. Students who understand how they fit with the demands of the job or the personality of their boss will be much more successful. Let's take a closer look at your personality type. Are you an extrovert or an introvert? These are terms used to describe how you prefer to interact with the world. Extroverts focus their energy outwards and tend to be more talkative and outgoing in their dealings with others. Introverts are more reflective and tend to take more time before speaking up. Chances are you already know which is closer to your preferred way of dealing with the world. If in doubt, just choose one that you think best describes you now. And now I'd like you to stand up, move around, leave all your material on your chair, and have the extroverts move up to the left side of the screen and introverts to the right. And as you're moving up, I'd like you to arrange yourself so that those who are really clear that they're extroverts or introverts are closest to the screen. This is how you should be lining up. Extroverts on the left, introverts on the right, clearest preferences closest to the screen. These circles represent a five by five group who would be very clear that they are either extroverts or introverts. These groups would be pretty clear about their preferences. These groups less so, and in the middle would be people who really weren't sure. This horseshoe shape is very common and expected. Your 5x5 five five, number 6 is from an introverted or an extroverted perspective. What would be your idea of an ideal co-op work environment? 
what would be your idea of the ideal relation leadership style of your co-op work manager? Pause the video for 10 minutes. Five minutes for the five by five plus five minutes to debrief. Now we're going to go for a coffee break, 15 minutes. When called back by the facilitator, please regroup into new groups of five. The moderator will pause the video for 18 minutes, 15 for the coffee break and three for regrouping. So pause the video now. As we come back for another group session, we'll look at another type exercise. And this time we're asking the question, are you a judging type or a perceiving type? Judging and perceiving are two ways of describing how you like to deal with the world. Judging types, by the way, judging here does not mean being judgmental or condemning. It means making a judgment or a decision. They like to organize their world and feel most comfortable when they have the plan and things are worked out. Perceiving types like to be open to new opportunities and therefore are seen to be more spontaneous and flexible. A judging type who planned a trip would likely want to have a daily itinerary. This way, they would feel they were getting the most from it. On the other hand, a perceiving type would find that restrictive. For them, the joy of a trip is stumbling across the unexpected and being free to explore new things as they come up. It's not a matter of being right or wrong. They are different and complementary ways of doing things. So make a decision now. Are you more of a judging type or perceiving type? So we have the same instructions as last time. Judging types line up to the left of the screen, perceiving types on the right. Clearest preferences nearest the screen. So just put all your stuff on the chairs and get up and move around now. And as before, this is how you should be lining up. The groups in the circles are the clearest of their preferences. Very clear organized types on the left, very clear spontaneous types on the right. The seventh five by five is from a judging or perceiving perspective. What would be your idea of an ideal co-op work environment? So if you're a judging type, what would be your idea of an ideal co-op environment? If you're a perceiving type, what would be your idea of an ideal co-op environment? And similarly, from those two perspectives, what would be your idea of the ideal leadership style of your co-op work manager? So pause the video for 10 minutes. Five minutes for five by five and five minutes for moderator to debrief. So pause the video now. This is a general question we can, moderator will ask for, for everybody. Do you think an extroverted perceiving, which means an outgoing and spontaneous co-op student, might have a personality clash with an introverted judging, i.e. a quiet and organized workplace manager? So what would the student who is an outgoing and spontaneous, what would that outgoing and spontaneous student do that might get on the manager's nerves? And what would the manager, who is a quieter, more organized person, do that would puzzle and frustrate the student? Pause the video for five minutes. Five minutes for the moderator to survey the whole group on these questions. And now shifting gears. Moving away from the concepts of Bridges Transitions or Young's Personality Types, I'm going to introduce another piece of the puzzle, and that is the psychosocial factors relating to student retention. The following data on 10 psychosocial factors comes from 20,000 college students using the Type Focus program. These are the 10 psychosocial factors linked to re retention. They make sense. For example, if someone has good time management skills, they are more likely to succeed in their education because they will complete their assignments on time. In this graph, the horizontal axis is high school grades and the vertical axis is the percent of students assessing themselves on their time management skills. More A students assess themselves at the higher end of the scale. About twice as many A students rank themselves much above average than much below average. The pale, pale blue line is twice as high as the dark red line. B students are about even on their rankings. And lower grade students start to go the other way. Many more begin to rank themselves as much below average, about twice as many, a reversal from the A students. So now the dark red bar is twice as high as the pale blue bar. 
Since high school grades predict very well for college success, even better than SAT scores, this is a significant finding. And it shouldn't come as a big surprise that judging types, the more organized types, tend to score higher on time management than their perceiving counterparts. There are about as four times as many J's in the higher time management rankings and just the opposite in the lowest levels of time management ranking. Most are perceiving types. A competitive attitude is another psychosocial indicator of grade point average. In this case, most of the A students rank very high in the competitive attitude, so their yellow is much higher than their green. The higher B grades are flat in this measure, and the lower B grades and C grades swing the other way. Most of them now show a lack of competitiveness. So their low competitive attitude, the green scores, are much higher than their high competitive attitude, the yellow scores. And as you might expect, the judging types are more competitive than the perceiving types. Judging types predominate in the higher levels of competitiveness and tend to reverse in the lower levels of the scale. So, so far, we've looked at three concepts, transitions, personality type, psychosocial factors related to retention. Now we'll start to bring them together. The data comes from 78 first-time, full-time students from a large state university with GPA and retention status available. The students started in 2007. One year later, 18 dropped out, 60 were still enrolled. This is about a 23% dropout rate, which is pretty average. Type focus data was captured at the beginning of the 2007 school term. The chi-square results comparing enrolled versus not enrolled after one year all were in expected direction. This means that the more the student accepted responsibility, the greater their retention. The more they, they had academic competitiveness, the more they, re, they re, were retained. The higher their self-esteem, the more they were retained. The general health being better, the more they retained. Better time management skills, more retention, and so forth. Chi-square is a statistic telling you how certain you can be that the results were not random. The smaller the number, the greater the confidence you have in the results. In this case, the two variables that stand out are social support and external commitments. All these variables have an effect, but these two are most trustworthy in their ability to predict whether a student will remain in the program after one year. The validity of my last statement is backed up by this graph, where the high to very high level of social support had much higher percentages of the students enrolled after a year, and conversely, Look how high the percentage of dropouts occur in the low and very low levels of social support. So the social support in the high end on the right-hand side of the x-axis, the green were very high. When we go to the low end of the social support, the red bars, meaning they were not enrolled, grow much higher. Students who scored low on social integration, example, they would not agree that they have made good friends on campus are an interesting group. 19 of the 78 scored low to very low category. As you can see, 10 were introverts and 9 were extroverts. So it's about 50-50. However, you can see that all 10 introverts persisted and only 5 of the 9 extroverts did. This was a highly significant result as measured by the chi-square statistic. In this case, all 10 students with very low to low scores on social integration who were introverts persisted. Only five of the nine extroverts did. Low integration is much more troublesome for extroverts and introverts. This shows how much more insight you can gain into the data by combining personality type information into it as well. If we combine all 10 psychosocial factors together and look at the top one-third of the scores, we can see that the enrolled students had twice as high a score as the dropouts. Conversely, in the bottom one-third of the scores, almost twice as many dropped out. What we're basically showing is the validity of these scores have very high predictive rates for the students staying in the course or dropping out. If we combine just some of the stronger variables, in this case general health, social support, and external commitments, the predictability gets better. 
Now the predictability is 0 0.06. You can see the predominance of enrolled, the green bars, at the higher end of the scores, an obvious shift to the dropouts, the red bars, at the other end. In this table, showing results for external time commitments, the heavy and very heavy groups had a 33% dropout rate compared to a 5% rate for enrolled. Heavy time commitment beyond one's course load is a killer. The failure to thrive model is the model that I put together looking at two main components. First of all, there's the aptitude that the students have coming into the program. This would be measured most clearly by their high school marks. And secondly, whether or not they are supported in the transition, looking at the psychosocial, general health, and external demand factors. So you can either have, in this case, a low aptitude. They come in with poorer grades, but they are supported. Students in this category will likely struggle with the transition. They may need basic training. They may need to drop courses. They may need to attend summer school. They may need to change their major or transfer. There may be a stopout, which is defined as not a dropout, but someone pauses in their academic uh, adventure. So what we have here are students that struggle because they are not academically as prepared as they should be, and, but they are supported, so they make it through. Their neutral zone is a period of time when they're answering questions about themselves that they need to answer, and they'll likely succeed in the future. Students with good skills and support most likely will succeed. Most will persist. A few may have learned what they need to learn and drop out, but they are functioning at a higher level. A student who is well-functioning, discovers that the program they're in is not for them in a very meaningful way, moves on to something that will fit them better, so in the end, they don't see themselves as a failure. It's seen as a learning experience. The people in this quadrant who have poor skills and no support really struggle with transition. I think of them as the lost souls. Their failure is dramatic. The low GPA in the first term for the fall 2008 students was an average of less than 1.3. These students all had struggles and dropped out. If they have good skills but they're not supported psychosocially, they will struggle. They'll likely have lower than expected GPA. They might be seen as being fragile, at risk for negative events. If they break up with their boyfriend or girlfriend, it throws them into a tailspin and they may flee the neutral zone. They have an unexpected, based on their high aptitude, failure to thrive. They tend to not thrive as you would expect given their great uh, academic qualifications coming into the program. Now if we go back to this familiar table based on the 2012 data from Ontario, how does it relate to type focus failure to thrive model? It doesn't appear as if the dropout rate is due to poor academic preparation. So most of the students in college are not that poorly prepared. Very few of them, 6.2%, are dropping out because they can't handle the academic qualifications. It looks like it is the difficult neutral zone, along with the personality type factors, like a personality clash with their co-op managers, and the psychosocial factors, most likely time commitments beyond their regular course load and social support, especially the closely knit cultural communities like First Nations. Their transitions are larger. To close off this session, I've been given permission to display some real data. In this case, from the Georgian College students who enrolled between January and March of 2012. This graph shows the students' ratings for the question, I'm satisfied with my choice of major or program. You can see that 30 were neutral, 5 disagreed, and 1 strongly disagreed. 36 students would probably benefit from a discussion about what's going on, and do they need to shift to a different program? How motivated can they be to continue? This graph shows students' ratings for, I have clearly identified my career goal. Here we see 77 students who are unsure, 10 who are saying, I don't have a clue. If you were working hard, struggling through the neutral zone, how motivated would you be to continue if you really didn't know all your effort was going in the right direction? This is one student's answers to the questions on social support. 
When they answered the questions, my friends all agreed that getting a good education is important. They disagreed. They answered the question, my family is proud of me for getting an education. They disagreed. They answered, my family understands and is sympathetic to the amount of work my studies take. They strongly disagreed. The chances for this student, based on our research, are slim. Do you have a role to play here as a co-op advisor? This student's score ratings for external commitments are very low. This means a poor rating, because that means they have very high external commitment load. You can see that the amount of time they spend on family responsibilities during the school year is at least 30 hours a week and the amount of time on employment during the school year is another 30 hours a week. And the amount of time they spend on non-academic commitments besides family and work during the school year is 10 hours a week. So this student is spending 70 hours a week above and beyond their official course load. This student's chances are slim. The last 5x5. Five five. What can be done to make the transition more successful for your co-op students? something you can do before their first co-op experience, some sort of orientation or inoculation to the neutral zone, during their co-op experience, what support might be needed, after their co-op experience, the kind of debriefing that would make sense. Could you incorporate the concepts of transitions, personality type, and psychosocial factors into it? Pause the video for 10 minutes, 5 minutes for the 5x5, five five, and 5 minutes for the moderator to debrief. As we begin to wrap up, there are some best practices available. What can be done to support students who are in, in transition? First of all, there's an early warning system. High school marks are a good indicator of su college success, as well as the type focus success factors. Proactive advising, counseling, and mentoring. Accurate choice of majors helps students succeed and retain. Integrated support programs. Career and co-op offices with student affairs and counseling offices can work together for increased effectiveness. In summary, take heart. Complex but doable. Can't do everything at once, but you can do something at once. Start small and prove as you go. Collaborate with other departments with different budget lines so you can share the cost burden. And finally, thank you. I hope this video session has been worth your time. I wish I could have been there in person to meet you.